And this is my concern about Israel. The Israelis aren't taking it seriously. They think they've got us and that we can stop anything. We can't stop anything. Under what conditions can you live in peace with Israel? Answer that question. It's not reminiscent uh, in one sense. This is much larger uh, than what went forward in the past. The Turks have tried to provide humanitarian aid to Gaza on several occasions. The Israelis have frequently embargoed, uh, especially from the sea, anything going in or coming out of Gaza. And so in 2010, uh, some IDF commandos landed on board the ship. And as you pointed out, 10 people were killed and some of them were Turkish soldiers. They were all Turkish citizens. And that had a, a really terrible impact in Turkey. It really shook the, the whole nation. It could not understand why it was necessary to use deadly force to stop that humanitarian aid from reaching Muslim Arabs in uh, Gaza. This is much larger. And we need to understand what this is about. This is not an accident. Mr. Erdogan probably had this round in the chamber ready to fire. And what he's doing is it's not so much Israel. Clearly, he wants to send aid to Gaza. That's indisputable. Makes good sense. But what he's really doing, Judge, is that he's saying something to us. And what he's saying is this. We know that once we launch this flotilla, that we are likely to have problems with the Israelis, who are probably going to try and stop us from getting through. We expect that. The question is, Washington, D.C., President Biden, Senate and House, what are you going to do? Are you going to let this train wreck in Gaza continue down the tracks until it crashes at the bottom of a long, deep ravine? Or are you going to finally pick up the phone and say, enough, no more, it's got to stop? And we don't know yet. Uh, what we know, is, as I've said before, and I think others have pointed this out, that right now, the single most powerful political figure and decision maker in Washington, D.C., is Mr. Netanyahu, not Mr. Biden, nor anyone in the Senate or the House. In fact, the Senate and the House are falling all over each other to provide Mr. Netanyahu anything he wants, to do whatever he wants. I don't know what Mr. Biden really thinks, uh, and we've talked about that before. So the question is, what about it? Are we going to stop the train wreck? Are we going to try and keep this from going completely off the rails and exploding? which is really what Mr. Putin is saying is going to happen, or are we going to do nothing and leave it to Mr. Netanyahu to decide? The Turks have made it very clear they have no intention whatsoever, no uh, malicious intent, if you will, towards the Israelis. Absolutely not. Uh, these are unarmed vessels. I Just as the vessel back in 2010 was unarmed, I, so I see no evidence for that at all. I think it's exactly what I said. This has less to do with the Israelis than it does to do with Washington. We are the ones who control the cards in the game as far as Israel is concerned. We are Israel's only friend and true ally. Now others will profess it, but let's be frank, we are it. We're the ones who have provided the military backstop to whatever Mr. Netanyahu wants to do. You know, go back to uh, 2000, 2001, there were incursions into Gaza made by Ariel Sharon. They went in there, they destroyed some buildings, bulldoze things. Soon the phone rang in Tel Aviv and Sharon listened to the president of the United States on the other end at the time. It was uh, W, the second Bush. And he said, look, Ariel, you can't do this. You're going you're gonna to make more enemies than, than you need. This has to stop. We're trying to negotiate and work out a deal. You've got to pull those forces out right away. By the way, the Israeli generals at the time also made the same uh, recommendation to Ariel Sharon saying, don't go in there and don't do this. It's not going to help us. We don't have that now. There's nobody at the other end of the phone line right. capable of saying anything other than, yes, Mr. Netanyahu. Yes, Mr. Netanyahu. So this is this is not about harming Israelis at all. That's the last thing that Mr. Erdogan wants to become involved with. This is about providing aid. But it's a stalking horse to find out what's really going to happen in Washington, to, well, to show the world who's really in charge. Well, in 2010, the Israeli commandos stormed the ship. Chris, if you want to put it up again. Uh, they killed, killed 10 uh, Turkish soldiers through some means either negotiation or litigation. The Israeli uh, government paid $10 million to the Turkish government, theoretically, to be distributed to the families of those uh, that, were, uh, that were killed. Do you expect a confrontation like that this time? Will the Israelis do everything they can to prevent these NGOs, non-government organizations, 
from delivering food, water, and fuel to the poor people in Gaza? I don't know, but I suspect there will be an attempt to minimize it, if not stop it altogether, because the Israelis are at war. Their view is that they face an existential threat from Gaza in the form of Hamas. Now, keep in mind that Hamas is a school of fish swimming in an ocean. In order to get to Hamas, get the school of fish, you have to drain the ocean. Now, whether or not they'll ever, ever get to that school of fish is open to debate, but Mr. Netanyahu is draining the ocean. He wants to expel that population. That's the mm -hmm. point. Now, some people want to call it genocide. I'm reluctant to use that word. Uh, I think expulsion is certainly justified. And there's plenty of evidence, as you pointed out the other day, especially with regard to that refugee camp for some decisions that certainly are criminal or at least border on it. But the bottom line is that that's what he's up to. That's what he wants to do. He has the backing of probably 85% of the uh, Jewish electorate. They've had it with Hamas. They've had it with Gaza. So the only way that this stops, as Mr. Erdogan knows, is for the president of the United States to intervene and stop it. So okay. that's what this flotilla is really all about. We call for joint efforts of the international community aimed at de-escalating the situation, a ceasefire and finding a political solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And the BRICS states and countries of the region could play a key role in this work. Well, we shouldn't be surprised. We've done everything in our power to transform Russia into an implacable enemy of the United States. Uh, we poured buckets of filth and abuse all over Putin's head, condemned him as a criminal, described him in terms I wouldn't use for my mother-in-law. Uh, <laughs> you won't go there. <laughs> the, the, the bottom line is that he's, uh, you know, he's sending another signal, though, and, he, and he's right to do this. He's saying, look, you know, this is not going to be contained. You're on a road to spreading this conflict because Putin is being in touch with Erdogan, uh, Raizi, Nasrullah, Assad, the King of Jordan, General Sisi, all the, all the principal figures, uh, figures in this drama. So <clears throat> he knows how serious this is. We are the ones that refuse to take this as seriously as it should be taken. And this is my concern about Israel. The Israelis aren't taking it seriously. They think they've got us and that we can stop anything. We can't stop anything. In other words, if this runs out of control, we are limited in what we can do. And the Israelis don't seem to understand that. The American people, I don't think, are even engaged. And so he's really speaking to Washington and he's trying to say, look, this is very dangerous. And by the way, by you can infer from this that he will stand behind Iran and potentially Turkey and the others in the region if they are drawn into the conflict with Israel and the United States. Colonel, and does stand behind mean PR statements or military stand no, behind? I, I think it also involves <clears throat> military power, just as we are involved militarily with Israel. And I think we take that into consideration. It's not something that he's going to look for as an opportunity. Right. But he's going to let Iran be destroyed by us. He's not going to stand by and allow Turkey to take a beating if, if they both end up in conflict with Israel. You know, and, and how many times have people pointed out <clears throat> who has been intervening all over the world repeatedly in the affairs of other countries? Right. And right. we are seen, consequently, in a very negative light. And the grievances people have against us go back to the 1950s. When you, when you talk to Iranians, they'll take you through the whole chapter and verse of what's been going on there since the 50s regarding our interference in, in their internal affairs. Remember that both the, Soviet, the, the, the Chinese and the Russians have made it clear uh, on repeated occasions that they will do business with people, they will cooperate with people, they will help and assist people, they will not intervene in the internal affairs of other countries. Colonel, here's uh, South African President Cyril Ramposa, who uh, was more direct than President Putin and who spoke at the same conference right after President Putin did. The collective punishment of Palestinian civilians through the unlawful use of force by Israel is a war crime. The deliberate denial of medicine, fuel, food and water to the residents of Gaza is tantamount to genocide. He's simply echoing the sentiments of virtually all of the Arab states, the Iranians, the Turks, the states in North Africa, Central and South Africa. Everyone is watching this. The Chinese certainly are. 
And remember, these are people who've lived in countries where those things were denied from time to time for various reasons, wars or uh, authoritarian governments. They know what that means. They, they know what famines do. They understand what mass deportations mean, mass expulsions. They, all of these people have been through these things. So unsurprisingly, they're very sympathetic to the Arab population in Gaza. You know, the, the whole NATO question probably deserves a lot more attention and a lengthier discussion than you're going to get it here. But I think we need to understand something. NATO is emerging from this operation in Ukraine with a lot of blood on its hands and a very serious black eye. You had Stoltenberg, who just a few months ago said, if we lose, in other words, we NATO are seen as losing in Ukraine, it could have ugly consequences for the future of the alliance. Well, I don't think the alliance, strictly speaking, has much future. If you are living in Eastern Europe right now or anywhere on the Russian periphery, and you truly believe that in the event of a conflict that might erupt on your borders, that the United States is going to send forces in a timely manner to rescue you in a war, uh, you are probably delusional because we can't. Uh, we can send something eventually, but not enough to make any difference quickly. And now we have Ukraine, where we built a force from the ground up over the period of, what, eight years? We equipped it better than most forces in the North Atlantic Treaty Alliance, and it lost. It didn't simply lose. It was utterly annihilated. The true scale of the defeat is not known in the West. Everyone has gone to great lengths to suppress the information to conceal the tragedy. The Ukrainian nation is destroyed. Now, I'm not saying that the Russians have any interest in Eastern Europe. I don't think they have any interest whatsoever in moving in that direction. I think they'd like to do business with everybody. Right. But we're busy insisting that you can't cooperate or work with us unless you have a government and a society that looks like us. Assuming that we look all that good, that's another matter. Right. That, that's our that's our attitude. That's crazy. Yeah. You know, why have we cooperated over the years with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia if it didn't fit our notions of what is right and what is wrong? Well, whatever you want to say, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has turned out to be a very stable society with a stable government. Uh, a retired general of the Israeli Defense Force several years ago said to me as I was uh, driving with him along the Golan Heights, he said, you know, Douglas, we should have gone to Madagascar. Now, most of your audience don't understand, will not understand what that means. But at the time when the Zionist movement was taking off, there were lots of dis discussions about where should we Jews go. Mm. And one of the destinations was Madagascar. There was absolutely no determination early on for any reason that it absolutely desperately needed to be in the Middle East and in Palestine, or what we call Palestine, certainly since the Roman Empire. His point was simple. You know, look, if we'd gone somewhere else, we probably would have been far happier and far more successful because we were planted in a region where from the moment we arrived, we were treated as a bacillus as an infection. Mr. Netanyahu has acknowledged this. He has said publicly, this is a civilizational conflict. He is correct. Israel is not, strictly speaking, a Middle Eastern state. It's an extension of the West. It is a Jewish form of Western civilization, but it is nevertheless an extension of it. It is not part of the Islamic world, and the Islamic world has never accepted it. So the, the problem I have with what Mr. Xi is saying, not, not with his ultimate purpose, but he, he needs to point out that from the moment they arrived, the Jews were unwanted. They were under assault. And so they seized what they have by force. And we, and to a lesser extent, the British, have helped them to stay there and flourish and survive. But 75 years later, the same condition that made them unwelcome is still there. It hasn't changed. But the quality and the capabilities of their adversaries or potential opponents, those things have improved dramatically. And they can no longer play off the various actors against each other, which they've done very successfully for many years. Now, the last point is this. Mr. Xi said something that's very important, and I absolutely agree with the president on this. President Xi said an authoritative conference, in other words, an outcome that can be imposed on the people in the region. That is the way that issues have been settled, certainly in Europe for centuries, and I would argue to some extent in Asia for centuries. In other words, we're not going to tolerate any more squabbling or conflict. This is how it's going to be. The great powers stepped up and imposed it.
But will there be an authoritative imposition of the state of Israel while well, Bibi Netanyahu, an independent state of Palestine, while well, Bibi Netanyahu was the prime minister of Israel? No, but it also won't. No authoritative uh, solution will be imposed as long as we are heavily engaged because we are unambiguously on Israel's side. Right. And again, as I've said before, I support Israel as well. Unfortunately, I think at this stage, it should be pretty clear to everyone that the two-state solution is dead. I don't know why people keep bringing it up, because one of the things that Mr. Netanyahu set out to do was to destroy it. Remember, I pointed out that the danger here is that is the Israelis have burned several bridges behind them. In other words, they crossed the Rubicon and they can't go back. They can't go back. Part of it is a certain amount, I think, of cynicism because they know it is fundamentally unacceptable to the Israelis. And as a result, we probably won't support it. But they also feel that there a great injustice has been inflicted on the Arabs in Palestine. Okay. And they are correct. It, it, the Arabs have suffered an injustice. This injustice is very old, go all, about, all the way back 75 years. There's no question about it. But that's, that's not going to change. Uh, because you now have a state in the region. And the key question is this, all right, Hamas, under what conditions can you live in peace with Israel? Answer that question. Then you turn to Mr. Netanyahu and say, Mr. Netanyahu, under what conditions can you and your government live peacefully with your neighbors, specifically the Muslim Arabs on the West Bank and those in Gaza? They've got to answer those questions. Until you've answered those questions honestly and openly, it's pointless to hold a conference. Last uh, subject, I'm checking my iPhone. I don't see anything new uh, on the explosion at the American-Canadian border, but you seemed very concerned about this when we uh, emailed each other uh, before we came on air. Do you know any more about it, Colonel? No, but my concern stems <clears throat> from the following. Go back to 2001. When that tragedy in New York occurred, the very first action that was required was not to invade someone else's country. It was to close our borders, secure our ports and airports, and find out who was actually in the country. We didn't do that. What we did was talk about invading other people's countries, Afghanistan and ultimately Iraq. And that, that was a serious mistake. I don't right. know what will happen now, but I do remember sitting on an aircraft flying down to CENTCOM in January of 2002 and having a short, amicable, but nevertheless short argument with a passenger who kept saying, you know, this is Iraq. They're behind this. We need to get rid of these Muslims. We need to get rid of these Arabs. And I said, well, first of all, uh, I don't know who was on the airplane, but it remains to be seen that Iraq or anybody else had anything to do with this. Haven't you ever heard of anything called Al Qaeda? Of course, that went nowhere. And that was that was an advantage for the people in the Bush administration who wanted desperately to march into the Middle East. Well, we marched in and it was a catastrophe and we never needed to go in in the great numbers that we did in Afghanistan. And everyone with experience in the region said, you can go in there with a large enough supply of gold and buy Osama and his friends from the locals because they're not Afghans and ultimately they'll sell them to us. No one would listen to that. Everyone wanted the grandiose gesture of bombing and strafing and shock and awe. Yes. 